Okay, I guess we should get it started. Will you just uh, hit the slide for me when I ask you to? Because I had to be up there. So <laughs> somebody has to move the slide for me. systems that we have learned to control at the sort of few spin or few atom or few photon or few qubit level uh, and there are examples of several qubits or quantum bits on this uh, slide uh, which are coupled typically to some kind of field, control field. Uh, in the case of an ion trap it's some uh, light that is controlling the ion in the case of a superconducting qubit uh, coupled to a transmission line it's a microwave field that is controlling the qubit and uh, atoms and BECs that are also controlled by light so as you can see light, electromagnetic radiation and its interactions with single quantum systems, few qubit quantum systems is a very exciting area of current research and I hope this course will give you the tools that you need to understand the current area of research. Okay, next slide please. So to begin with, we'll just get the logistics out of the way very quickly. So we're going to have the lectures here, obviously, in this uh, room. Uh, that's my office. You have my email. I'll be posting these uh, slides on CourseWeb and also my lecture notes. This is probably the maybe one of the few lectures that I'm going to be giving on PowerPoint, the rest of it will be mostly on the, on the whiteboard. So, uh, but at any time if you have any questions or comments or requests about the material or about, you know, learning about some uh, new subject, you know, just talk to me and we will, we will uh, we'll work something out. Okay, the assessments are basically homework. Uh, there will be homework assignment posted every Wednesday and typically due the following Wednesday. I will accept late homework solutions, but there will be a 10% penalty applied for every day that is late. You are encouraged to discuss with your other students who are in the class, but each student must write up the solutions independently. Next slide. Okay, uh, the other part of your assessment will be a final project presentation. This is uh, typically about 30 minutes for each student. We have enough students here that I think, you know, uh, about three classes should be enough. And each of you can be individual. Uh, you can do an individual presentation or a project that you're interested in. The list of topics I'll suggest towards the end of the, of the term. The final grade will be computed as homework 70, presentation 30%. How many of you are actually auditing the class as opposed to registered for credit? Anybody here auditing? Two students, okay. All right. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Um, I still recommend you try to do the homework and maybe give a presentation or something. Okay, the recommended textbooks for this class, we won't be having any one textbook. Uh, that's just because the way the material is in this area of research, uh, there's certainly a lot of basics that are common to many textbooks, but the presentation order and the particular area of research or area of um, specialization that we'll hopefully try to get to towards the end of the class. There isn't one particular textbook that covers all of it. And I'll tell you why. I mean, if you look at the textbooks, you'll see that each of them chooses to present the, the material 
are the sort of the um, uh, the course in uh, different ways. So, for example, uh, the first textbook, Elements of Quantum Optics by Meister and Sargent, uh, is going to talk about the uh, quantization of the field, and then it's going to go into a lot of uh, the semi-classical approach, and that's similar to what I'll be following in this class, which is a semi-classical approach to the atom field interaction, and then moving on to the quantization of the interaction between the atom and the field. And uh, that's sort of the approach followed by the other two textbooks over here. Uh, all three of these first textbooks are available online to the Pitt library, so you don't have to buy them, so that's great. Um, and so you can just uh, download the PDFs and start looking through them. And whenever appropriate, I'll, if there is a particular chapter from a textbook that's appropriate to a lecture, I'll try to reference that. I will try. Okay. And then the last textbook, which is a sort of a classic in this field, is also Quantum Optics by Scully and Zubairi, but that's not available uh, online. Uh, you can purchase a copy if you want to. But I don't think you will need it, but if you want to, you're welcome to do that. Okay, so the last uh, thing that I wanted to mention is another useful resource online. Uh, the uh, Professor M Mikhail Lukin at Harvard has uh, lecture notes on quantum optics, and uh, that's available online. Uh, you can uh, click on that link. And uh, there are, obviously, it's still a work in progress. It's being revised. So there might be typos and other errors. I think at some point, this might become a textbook as well. So we'll, we'll see if that happens. OK. Uh, all right, before we, well, before I get into the sort of uh, uh, outline of this course, sort of the plan that I have for the course, and this will be subject to adjustment as we go along, depending on how things are going, um, but let me just briefly go through it before I talk about the rest of the uh, material. Okay, so today's class is basically the introduction and overview for this uh, class. And then uh, in the next class or so, we'll have a review of quantum mechanics and basic atomic physics, just to make sure we're all hopefully on the same page. Uh, then I will talk about the atom field interactions, which is a semi-classical treatment. And by that, I mean that we will treat the atom as quantized, but the light field as being just classical. Okay. And this, interestingly, is enough to understand a huge variety of problems in the field. Okay. So that's sort of giving a description of all the various topics. I won't go into detail through them. When we get to that section, we can talk about each of those different uh, topics. Uh, then uh, we'll take a little bit of a pause and try to apply some of those concepts to some simple ideas for quantum state engineering, where I'll discuss things like the block sphere, uh, trapped ions, NMR. Maybe if there's some interest in superconducting qubits, we can try to cover something in superconducting qubits, since I see a couple of students from the, that research area. And a bit about entanglement uh, on that. OK, next slide. Then we will launch into the full quantum treatment of atom field interactions, uh, which is where sort of the meat of quantum optics lies. So we will discuss field quantization, uh, wigner weisskopf theory of spontaneous emission, two-level atom in a cavity, which is the James Cummings model. That's very important for understanding a lot of current research in this field. Uh, and then we'll get into the open quantum systems part, which is a little bit theoretical, but we'll try to uh, discuss some applications, and that's important if you're trying to actually uh, do uh, any calculations in this uh, area. So the master equation, which is the key equation for understanding open quantum systems, and I'll explain what I mean by open quantum systems in a little bit, uh, and we'll, we'll get into the application to, say, atomic response to a resonant field, uh, resonant fluorescence, and the Molo spectrum. And then we'll discuss two other approaches, which are equivalent to the master equation, but are very helpful when discussing actual uh, uh, calculations. Heisenberg, Langevin, and the stochastic wave function approach. And again, we'll try to discuss some applications towards various uh, topics in quantum optics. Last slide. Uh, next slide. Okay. 
Uh, continuing now, going back to the atom field interactions, which we started before we launched into open quantum systems. We will come back to that, but now that we'll be armed with all the tools of uh, open quantum systems, we'll be able to discuss in more detail things like uh, Fox states, coherent states, thermal states. Uh, we, I may move that part a little bit earlier also to the quantized electromagnetic field. I haven't quite decided where I'll put that yet because there are different places where you can discuss it. And that's actually typically what you'll see in the textbooks. Sometimes people will discuss the various electromagnetic field states, right, when they discuss quantization of the electromagnetic field, or sometimes they'll discuss it at this point after introducing all the uh, theory of open quantum systems. And that's because it gets immediately applied in things like cavity QED, uh, for, which is cavity quantum electrodynamics, which is the Purcell effect, Jane's Cummings collapse and revival, uh, single photons on demand. Uh, that's an interesting application for quantum communication. And uh, then uh, the various uh, places in which uh, quantum dynamics, that is the full quantum treatment is important, things like uh, nonlinear mixing processes, parametric amplification, squeeze light. Squeeze light happens to be one of the first areas in which quantum optics became really uh, important to understand the quantum treatment uh, so that we could uh, make higher precision measurements. So uh, that's one of the big application areas for quantum optics, which is in making precision measurements of quantities. Um, and then finally, again, we'll return to quantum information. I'll try to discuss two sort of uh, applications of all the theory that you've learned, which is laser cooling of a trapped ion and spin photon entanglement. And beyond this, we can also talk about anything else, uh, other topics that will come to mind as we go along. If there's something interesting, we can try to discuss it, or we can leave it for the final project presentations. At that point, we can start reading the literature in the field and discuss it. OK, so today's class is just introduction and overview. So let me take a little break from PowerPoint. Um, let's see, can you mute that? Thing? Sometimes mute can also be right. Okay, all right. We'll just uh, turn on the. You're going to have to solve this problem next time. How can I actually mute this? But I won't be using it much longer, so it's okay. So there are different ways to think about. Uh, this the broad overview of quantum optics and where it's applicable. Certainly a historical perspective is very useful. So let's think about classical optics. Back in 1900 BC already, the Egyptians, oh, is it, is it the off? That's what we pressed. Didn't turn off? Well, it's off now, so that's it. It's blue right now. Oh, it's blue right now. Okay, all right. Well, that's a little better than the white. Okay, so back in 1900 BC, already the Egyptians had uh, mirrors, right? So they knew about optics. And uh, from there, the field uh, continued uh, essentially in fits and starts. So for uh, just paralleling the whole rise of science itself over the last couple thousand years, we had uh, the Greek civilization, Eros, uh, discovery of what we now call Fermat's principle. He initially realized how to apply that to reflection and used it for various magical uh, tricks. Uh, you know, there's a famous story that uh, Archimedes, or was it Aristotle, I can't remember, one of them had these mirrors that they used to burn up a ship 
in the uh, in one of the wars in, in, in ancient Greece. I don't know how true that is, but anyway, that is, or maybe at least a blind man or something. Anyway, so classical optics had a very long uh, history. Then moving on, we it pretty much continued mostly in the eastern part. We the Arab and uh, Arabian and uh, Chinese and Indian civilizations. I, I guess again, pretty much there were the dark ages. We had the 1600s where people started again rediscovering optics, the principles of optics in Europe. And then there was an explosion in the field, again paralleling the rise of physics itself, starting with Newton, moving on to all the various experiments, uh, Galileo, telescope, so on and so forth. So classical optics took a very, very long time sort of to develop. But then once we had the foundation with Maxwell, and then moving on to the sort of the quantum regime with uh, ideas from the black body radiation and relativity, the uh, Einstein, that's when we can say sort of the modern era of optics, which is uh, classical and quantum optics, has really uh, begun. So when it comes to quantum optics, and I'll try to go over a brief overview of the field, uh, or a history of the field, sorry, but before doing that, I wanted to give a sort of more physics flavor for where quantum optics might be uh, relevant, okay? And I'll try to do that by just thinking about what regime are we going to be discussing for the fields and the frequencies that are involved in quantum optics. You know the fields and frequencies that we normally think about in classical optics. And we'll try to uh, give sort of a borderline or, or, or a region where these two areas might be intersecting or overlapping. Okay? So let's start with you know, a simple picture. So the simple picture is, suppose the entire universe was just put in a box, right? So here's my box. And inside this box are photons, right? Electromagnetic radiation. And there are atoms. Atoms all around, we'll focus on one of them. But in general, we are mostly interested in the electromagnetic radiation and how it's going to interact with the atoms. So, typically, the way that we approach this problem in physics is to think about this box as having various normal modes. We'll solve the electromagnetic field equations in this box with these boundary conditions, right? That's what we do in. Uh, physics, we have differential equations describing the electromagnetic field, and we're going to solve them with the boundary conditions of this box. Okay? And so when we solve those equations, we're going to get normal modes. And what are the equations? They are just Maxwell's equations. In this case, there are no other sources for the electromagnetic field in the problem. right? So we're just going to write that del squared A minus 1 over C squared dou squared a dou d squared equals 0, where a is the vector potential for the electromagnetic field. And so I've written it in terms of the vector potential because, and I'm going to also say, choosing a certain gauge, as you all know from electromagnetic theory, I can choose a gauge when there are no field sources present such that phi equals 0, the uh, uh, potential. So the vector potential and the scalar potential are chosen in this way and, and satisfy these equations. Uh, so that we then, when we have put in the boundary conditions for this box, this is a very sort of, you know, I'm giving a hand-waving picture here for what is going on because it's good to have that sort of hand-waving estimation picture before we launch into a lot of the heavy math that we get to later on in the course. So in this picture, we have various normal modes, right? And we can expand this field A in terms of those normal modes, right? So let's just choose one normal mode, again, for simplicity. And you all know what that normal mode is going to look like. It's going to have some amplitude and some E, which is the representing the unit vector that represents its polarization of that mode, times because we are in this box, we can easily solve the 
the, the boundary condition to just say that, this is, and this is just one of the modes, normal modes, which is propagating inside this box, right? So that particular normal mode will have some cosine k dot r minus omega t, and phi is already given to be zero. That represents one of the normal mode solutions to this particular problem, okay? And this um, a field, and of course we haven't yet written down how this field is interacting with the atoms. Yeah. We're just concentrating on the field part, okay? So from this field, we can derive, and we'll have some condition on k, the, uh, the wave vector, such that it will satisfy uh, the boundary condition from this box. Then we can immediately write down the electric field from the vector potential. Which I will just call as some E naught, just given by this omega times E naught. And of course, there's some relation between omega and k, but I'm not getting into all those details here. And then we'll write the B field. This k must go as omega over c, so I'll write that in. And I'll choose a unit vector, k cross e, which represents the uh, polarization of the B field, or the direction of the B field, which is just represented by the cross product between these two quantities. Okay. Okay. Now, I can ask, what is the energy density of the C. That's just given by the Maxwell equations to be this. And I'm going to take a time average of all of that because typically we are averaging over times, course meaning the time to be much fast, much uh, slower than the frequency with which the optical field is possible. So, okay, so I, I want, it's easy enough to plug all that in, uh, just, we're just going to use the fact that mu naught epsilon naught equals 1 over c squared. So with all that, once you substitute all of that, you get identical terms that we'll get from this and we have to take the time average and we know that when we take the time average of sine squared we're going to get a factor of two of one half so in the end this just works out to simple form okay so that's the energy per unit volume in the electromagnetic field in the single mode simple enough I think you've probably seen that before but now what we're going to ask is, okay, at what point is this going to be important for quantum optics versus classical optics? And we can make an estimate by simply saying that the energy per unit volume multiplied by the total volume of the box, if that is on the order of what? Will I have to worry about quantum optics? when the total energy is approximately on what scale, will I have to worry about quantization of the field? You're not allowed to answer. <laughs> you look like you're about to answer. <laughs> the energy of a single, single photon. Very good. You can speak up. 
You had a cheesecake of energy. Each one of them, right? So from this, we immediately get that the amplitude of the uh, vector potential is on this scale, right? And the amplitude of the electric field in a single photon is on this scale. And even though this was a very crude and you know simple argument derivation, turns out that this formula for the electric field, so this is the electric field This is the vector potential, amplitude for a single photon, and this is the electric field of a single photon. It turns out this formula for the electric field is pretty close to being correct in the fully quantum treatment of the electromagnetic field. There's just factors of two, which all depends on how you initially define the boundary conditions for the problem. So whether you choose running waves as your solutions or standing waves, that can make some changes in this factor of two. Okay, but otherwise, the scaling of this uh, electric field of a single photon is very much exactly given by this formula. And so what's important to notice is that it goes as 1 over square root of the volume of this box and it goes as uh, proportional to square root of the frequency of the photon. Okay? So those two quantities are going to be very important whenever we ask when do we have to consider the quantization of the electromagnetic field. So I did a little calculation which we, of course we again it's a very crude one because you know we don't know we haven't applied this to any specific problem yet that we are interested in but once again it gives us a scale for where things have to be okay so let me just continue over here so if i plug in so what do i put in for v the volume of the field that's the biggest question here, right? Because if I know the frequency, which typically, let's say I'm looking at visible light or I'm looking at microwaves or whatever, I know the frequency of the photon. So what is it that I'm going to put in for the volume of the photon? What? So let's try to give an upper bound for the field of a single photon. Okay, so we want what the maximum sort of value we can typically expect for this field from a single photon because the higher it is, then the easier it's going to be to measure the field from a single photon, right? So let's look at the upper bound by obviously then decreasing the mode volume V, right? So how small can I get the mode volume V to be? What do you think? Do we know of any uh, physics reason why there's a restriction on the mode volume V? Can I make it infinitely small if these are freely propagating waves in space. They are true solutions to Maxwell's equations in free space. Then do we have a restriction on this beam? How small can we make it? How tightly can I confine an optical beam. You've all done some optics, so you know this. Diffraction error. So on the order of lambda, right? In one dimension, let's say, cross section. So lambda squared will be your typical area. Then you can ask, well, what about the length? You could have various choices here. If it's truly freely propagating, then we can say, well, I'm going to make my observation over some time and all that and I can write down some, for example, one choice could be 
lambda squared is the area, right, by the diffraction limit, and the other would be some cylinder of length C delta T, and what is this delta T is just sort of a typical time that I have for my observation of the energy in that field, right? So this could be one choice, okay, C delta T, right? So that's certainly a valid choice. Another choice could be to say, well, I'm going to build some mirrors around this box, and I'm going to keep shrinking the distance between the mirrors till the field is as tightly confined as possible, right? Because as I said, our idea is to get to some sort of upper bound for this E naught, the field from a single photon. Again, once again, I have some limitation that I need to satisfy the boundary conditions on the mirrors, let's say, so typically this will also be on the order of some lambda because I have some field variation on that scale. So let's say that typically V is always you know, greater than or equal to lambda squared times lambda on the order of lambda cube. Okay? So that's what we call the mode volume of this electromagnetic mode. That's sort of the lower bound on this mode. Very again the sort of hand waving in our estimation, but it's a reasonable guess. So then, sort of upper bound on this field from a single photon, right, is just plugging that in, simple, right? Okay, and this is now easy to convert to a sort of uh, units because everything in here is constants or dependent on uh, wavelength. So when you do that, you get that this is going to be okay. So it's going to be proportional to the square of the frequency of the photon times some constants. Okay. And if you evaluate this, you can say, for example, for E naught on for 633 nanometers and then E laser wavelength we get that E naught equals 3.6, or sorry, 4, it's 3.6, 3.67 times 10 to the 5 volts per meter. Pretty substantial feet, kilovolts, right? 300 kilovolts per meter. Okay? So now let's ask what happens as we change the frequency. So why am I doing this? Let's let's step back. The reason was that I wanted to tell you at what range of fields and frequencies I have to start worrying about quantum effects. So here we have an answer. If we can uh, confine the photon to a mode volume roughly proportional to its wavelength, Q, then the field uh, strength from a single photon is pretty substantial, 300 kilovolts per meter. Okay. Of course, depending on the atom, the atom size is 10 to the minus 10 meters. The actual sort of potential drop across the atom is pretty tiny. So, but it's, it's still a fairly large field by normal standards. So now let's look at sort of a scale or, or, a, or a plot of this uh, formula just to again say, so here's my field from a single photon. Here's Frequency, and I'm going to use a logarithmic scale because clearly that's a uh, power law, right? S squared times some constant. So it's easy enough to plot in a power. So, okay, so I've done that here. So I'm going to choose some typical frequencies that we are interested in 10 to the 9 hertz, 10 to the 12, 10 to the 15, 10 to the 18, 10 to the 21, and I'm going mean, pass this, we are getting into sort of gamma rays and things like that. Then if I correspondingly plot what the numbers are, typical values, I get and I get a straight line, right? In this log log scale. That's just because I chose the steps here on this axis to be changing by six orders of magnitude. 
on each tick. And on this axis, I chose them to be changing by three orders of magnitude, which is a which gives you the relation f squared maximum value. So this is e naught of maximum e naught max again. I should say that for a single photon, right? So if my field has more than one photon in it, right? At what level is it that I can think of it as a classical field? Uh, you can set your own limit, right? So remember, we put the energy density in the field to be on the order of one photon, and we said now we have to worry about quantum effects. Obviously, if I multiply that by some average value n, where n is the number of photons in the field, then I'll start to approach a classical limit because that's the quantum to classical transition when there are enough number of excitations or if the momentum or, or whatever is high, right? That's typically how we think about it. When we want to go from quantum to classical, if you have a large number of excitations in the, in the object, then it's going to be behaving in a classical way. So when n, the average number of photons in this field becomes very large, then this field is going to behave classically. Right? What's large? Okay, you know that's totally up to you. You, in this case, because we are just doing a sort of again order of magnitude estimation. But we can start by saying, let's say on average, let's say n is on the order of 10 to the 4 thousand. That's clearly a very large number of photons. We're going to say that's that's going to be a classical field, which means correspondingly, if you look at e naught, you know if it's on the order of 10 to the 2 e naught max, 100 times the field of a single photon, then we are clearly in a classical regime. That's kind of my, again, as I said, hand-waving argument. OK, so now let's catch that on this graph. So again, you know, I'm not really being very careful here, but it's, it's OK. We're just trying to give a sketch of this region. It's going to look. So in all of this region, we're going to say classical optics should work. And in this little band over here, this is going to be quantum optics. So here's an interesting conclusion you can draw from this graph at first. What it says is that, I mean, you can look at this in a one of two different ways, which is that for any value of the wavelength, lambda, or the frequency, this is in hertz, sorry, for the units, this is words per meter, I already did that, okay, good. So for any value of the frequency, f, it says, this, this calculation says, I can always find some value of the field E0 that the field can be treated as classical. Right? That's, we can always go higher above this blue region, and we don't have to worry about quantization of the field anymore. We can just treat it as a classical. That's the initial conclusion of this argument. You believe it. I can always be classical in the behavior of the field at any frequency f as long as I choose an amplitude of the field that's large enough. Or conversely, actually, I should also mention this lower regime. This is actually why it's been so difficult to observe quantum behavior in the microwave domain. You can see very tiny amounts of field make the electromagnetic wave look classical. That's actually the reason it's taken so long to get to sort of this quantum cavity, quantum electrodynamics regime in the microwave domain. But it is now achievable regularly in a lot of research labs, including a uh, lab here at Pittsburgh by Michael Hadridge. So there's a whole 
region here, it says that, but and you can also see why it was so easy comparatively. The visible, which is the wavelength region that we initially selected, right here, 10 to the 14 hertz, there's a band. The fields are quite appreciable that you can uh, get quantum behavior, right? Or classical behavior. So, so you really have to reduce the field way down. We want to see quantum behavior in this low frequency regime. And then in the higher frequency, you have to, uh, you can see quantum effects with fairly uh, reasonable values of the field, which are easier to achieve. Okay, so what's wrong in that earlier statement I made, that you can always achieve classical behavior if I go to a high enough classic, uh, amplitude for the field at some frequency. What is this frequency over here? 10 to the 21 or 22 hertz. I told you those are gamma rays. Do you see gamma rays behaving classically or do you typically see them behaving in a particle type fashion? By classically, I mean sort of in a wave picture. Where you don't have to worry about you know, quantized effects. behave more in a quantum fashion, right? You typically can detect the gamma ray arriving as a click in your detector. The reason is that once h bar omega approaches the rest mass of an electron, or actually two times the rest mass of an electron, then you can create electron-positron pairs by conserving energy, right? So a gamma ray can spontaneously, right, in the language of quantum electrodynamics, give rise to a vertex where there is an electron and a positron coming in, right? Uh, or a positron leaving. Okay. So this is, will satisfy energy conservation and momentum conservation. So okay, so at some regime then. All of this breaks down, everything that I've been talking about. And we have to go back, let's say, somewhere around here. This is the land of quantum electrodynamics. And that is given by this diagram, right? We have to worry about effects like that. We're not going to consider those effects in this class at all. Okay, that's for your quantum field theory. We are going to be in this sort of region over here. Okay? We're going to consider mostly in this blue region, and we will ex we'll make excursions into the classical region just to say how can we describe fields that look classical using the quantum optics language that I'm going to talk about in this class. So that essentially sort of gives you in a picture, I guess, where quantum optics is important. So that you can look at any problem, hopefully, and say, does it fall in this regime? If so, I have to worry about it. Okay. At least where matter and light interactions are concerned. OK, so that, as I said, is a good way to um, give us some physics um, intuition for the problem. So, But it's also useful to see sort of the historical, uh, any questions, sorry, before I go on about this. Again, it's all hand waving. We'll try to make some of these ideas more definite, but I think when you take a course uh, on quantum optics, you should understand when you have to worry about those effects. And, and I thought this would be useful to do that. Okay. Good. Vikram, you understand everything? <laughs> yes, he understands. Okay, good. <laughs> all right. Okay, now we'll go back to the computer. Can you just project the next slide? Let's do it.
So before I go on, let me just go around the class and learn all of your names. of light which come in a unit of h bar omega and that is being absorbed and emitted by the atoms uh, in our electrons in the metal. So the word photon itself came into existence from Gilbert Lewis in 1926, so quite late on in the development of quantum mechanics. And the key role of light of course is you know it inspired ideas to treat matter on an equal footing with light by coming up with the idea of the matter wave, writing down a wave equation for uh, matter, and then continuing on to uh, Dirac's equations to explain the uh, relativistic effects for electrons and so on. Okay, um, the one big question that people had was uh, why does an atom actually decay? Because when you think about the Hamiltonian for an atom, it's perfect, right? You have eigenstates of the atom and those eigenstates should live forever. Once you are in a particular energy eigenstate, you don't decay from that energy eigenstate until Weisskopf and Wigner realize that you can use non-relativistic quantum mechanics coupled to a quantized electromagnetic field to describe spontaneous emission. And that was sort of the mark, uh, the development of QED that we could understand spontaneous emission by quantizing the electromagnetic field. And that is where quantum electrodynamics got its sort of start. Well, there are other experiments that motivated quantum electrodynamics. Next slide. Then for a while, the idea of like interactions in this regime, like I was sketching out, for you, everybody got very interested in that regime over there, right? That we were just showing on the on the screen, uh, on the black on the whiteboard, which is that regime where quantum electrodynamics, fully quantum treatment of both light and matter at a relativistic footing became important, right? And there's a lot of research, like the many Nobel Prizes, so on and so forth. But until the 1950s, sort of quantum optics as a separate subject, which is this regime over here that I've sketched out for you, was kind of not very well uh, defined as a separate subject. And what happened in the 1950s is that there were experiments and theory that came together to highlight the importance of coherence. What is quantum optics is really the importance of quantum coherence or superpositions in the interaction between light and matter. Okay. So the first inkling of this came from experiments by Hanbury, Brown and Quist, the famous HBT experiment, which showed that there were intensity correlations, the correlations between the field between the, not the fields, but between the intensities that were measured at two different detectors. So that was surprising for people, as we'll come to understand why in a little bit. A little bit. For example, they saw bunching of the statistics from the intensity uh, correlations of detectors. 
And this prompted a whole theory of photon statistics, photon counting, and the quantum theory of the coherence of light that had to explain this intensity correlations. And this led to, for example, Glauber's theory of coherent states. He uh, discovered it along with uh, three other people. Um, and But he's, uh, he eventually received the Nobel Prize for that and other contributions to, that, to the theory of quantum optics and photo detection. At the same time, there are these experiments going on in terms of the coherence between light and matter interactions. So the Rabi experiment, Ramsey, and various other people had carried out a lot of experiments showing that coherence played an important role in the light and matter interaction. And the two together sort of launched this theory of quantum optics. But because one could take the quantization of matter to be given and in either a classical field, but then treat the whole uh, Hamiltonian and the density matrix or the wave function in a coherent manner, and that gave explained many of these experiments. Or you could just treat the field as a quantum object, quantize it, and study these intensity correlations, or try to study the photo detection and coherent states, and uh, fog states and other uh, states of light that were important to understand. So, okay, next slide. Modern quantum optics, of course, was really launched when tunable lasers or lasers became available, which was until the 1970s. And once that was there, there was an explosion in the field, everything from observation of the so-called resonant fluorescence, which is a mono triplet. When you shine light on an atom, you find that Normally, if you just think about shining light on an atom, you should get elastic scattering. The, you should get a uh, spectrum of the light that is scattered, which is at the same frequency as the incident light for right? energy conservation. You may get some effects due to recoil of the atom and so on. I want to discuss that. What they found was, as they increase the intensity of the light, they actually get a triplet in the spectrum, which is called the Mollo triplet, observed by Stroud. And Furthermore, when they then studied the correlations of the light, the, this correlation between the intensity of the light in these different spectrum, they found that there was a very clear signature of a non-classical light, light that could not be explained by the classical optics regime, but truly required the quantum optics or quantized field description to understand. And that is observed by Kimball and Mandel, theory provided by these other three. Um, uh, along with the arrival of lasers, there was a whole field of nonlinear optics, down conversion, sque squeezing of light. There were cavities, optical and microwave cavities. Microwave cavities were a very huge uh, field, uh, especially by putting atoms into the microwave cavities. That's how a lot of the key ideas of cavity quantum electrodynamics were realized. Those were experiments carried out by uh, uh, people like uh, Harosh, and uh, Kimball and Randy. Last slide. Moving on from the 80s, 90s, and now almost two decades later from those initial experiments, we had uh, several successes of quantum optics in the 80s and 90s. For example, quantum optics was used to observe the violation of the Bell's inequalities that you read about in quantum mechanics. And uh, that came about because of all the developments in uh, both thinking about classical states and non-classical states of light, as well as in the atom, uh, atomic physics part, uh, where people were able to use beams of atoms or trap atoms and so on. That also led to many developments in things like laser cooling and trapping, Bose-Einstein condensation, those are all Nobel Prizes, and also at the same time, quantum optics at the single atom, single photon regime uh, in ion traps and how to do quantum control and quantum computing in ion traps, which is the first major proposal for quantum computing in an experimentally realizable uh, system that has already been, uh, you know, experiments are being conducted. So that uh, launched this whole field of quantum optics into a new regime where it was being used to understand both how things were working at the single photon, single quanta level, 
uh, single particle level. But also, we had this whole field of Bose-Einstein condensation, where there was these many body physics that was being studied in these uh, atomic traps the, uh, that were being used to capture the uh, uh, atoms in the, in the BEC. So let's uh, get the next slide. So open quantum systems, why are they so important? The, and the key reason is because all of these quantum information ideas represent are represented in this picture over here. So you have a classical field or a drive that you use to control a system that you're studying. The system could be a few particles like ion traps or uh, qubits like energy centers or superconducting qubits that you want to study. And then they're coupled to some environment. The environment can be other spins or in the case of ions, it can be other ions or it can be the potentials in the uh, ion trap, uh, whatever it is, the environment is some path, as we call it, or reservoir, there are all various words for this. The environment can be the electromagnetic field, as in the case of the uh, ion traps, or, or in most of the other cases, the environment is a, definitely an electromagnetic field, but there's also could be other things like other spins, other qubits that may sometimes be viewed as an environment for the system, and so on. So this kind of overall picture of this open quantum system, as we like to call them, because it's the interaction of a small system, atom or a cavity with an environment, while coupled to some external drive that we use to control the system. That is sort of the overall picture in which quantum optics or open quantum system has become very important. And nowadays, even the system can be a large number of atoms, which are trapped in some kind of Bose-Einstein condensate and then people are also very interested in applying quantum optics in this system because there's a lot of applications for understanding condensed matter uh, physics with this system. So for example, as I was just saying, sorry, these symbols when I moved it from my Mac to uh, to Windows, it got screwed up, but I tried to fix that when I post the slides. So here is a typical system. You have an atom which is being driven by a laser, right? The atom is approximated by two levels, which is a common approximation that we'll talk about. Uh, the ground state and the excited state, and then there's spontaneous emission in a photon. And then we can either detect that photon, or maybe not detect it. That is an interesting system for open quantum systems that we're going to study. Another very important open quantum system that we will look at is a photon that is trapped in a cavity that we were discussing that a uh, cavity represents a good way to sort of confine the photon. So we can see when we make this cavity smaller and smaller, we should definitely reach a regime very quickly where the cavity becomes, uh, the electric field becomes appreciable and you have to worry about the quantization of the field. So you have a cavity mode which you have to describe in a quantum mechanical fashion which we'll show or very typically describe by the harmonic oscillator, but then coupled to a bath, by the bath I mean just external modes of the electromagnetic field. The cavity will leak into the outer modes, and those that leakage looks like an environment for the cavity, or a bath for the cavity. Okay, next slide. Okay, so finally then, uh, as I said, in the last two decades especially, quantum optics has become very important in its connection to many different experimental systems, ion traps, atoms in cavities, and microwave cavities or optical cavities, and now recently superconducting qubits coupled to microwave cavities or transmission lines, uh, or NV centers that are coupled to photons or to other microwave excitations or other spins. So the goal is to obtain the control over these systems on the level of a single atom, single molecule, single photon, single electron spin. And that's what quantum optics these days really has become, is the study of these kinds of manipulation of two level atoms or systems via light and coupling of the system to its environment. The applications are all of these very important research areas, quantum computing, precision measurement, Fundamentals of quantum mechanics like entanglement, decoherence, probing 
of these systems. For example, how do you actually read out your quantum system? Typically, you have to interface it to light, to some microwave device, whatever it is, or some electronic transport, whatever you try to do. And then finally, sort of a key area that we are not going to probably discuss much in this class at all uh, is in the study of many body physics, but maybe, uh, you know, you can say a few words at the end of the class, Roger. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Or you were talking about Victor. <laughs> yeah. I thought I was going to say like maybe we can have a guest lecture from Professor Mong here. He will tell us about studying many body physics, cold atoms, uh, with uh, the quantum objects. Okay. I think for today, that's it. And in the next class, I'll begin with a review of quantum mechanics and quantum physics. If you have any questions, just let me know. Um, and I'll start putting all this up in the course work uh, sometime this week. Okay? All right. Thanks. Not this week, but yeah, next week. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it should be. I'll, I'll, I'll say it. Next week. Does cheese cake left? Mm. 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 Mm.